Hello, today we will talk about backtracking algorithm for solving constraint satisfaction problems using Anquin's problem as an example. Anquin's is one of the classic problems that is studied in the context of constraint satisfaction problems, together with Sudoku, scheduling, and other problems of that class. Constraint satisfaction is not the only way to solve this problem but it's a good example for the backtracking algorithm that I want to show you. Let's start with our problem definition. We start with an empty chessboard with dimensions n by n, and we need to place n queens on that chessboard in such a way that no queen attacks another. If you don't know chess, queens can attack each other if they are on the same diagonal, horizontal, or vertical. Here you can see an example of an empty chessboard, and here you can see an example of the solved problem. As usual, we start with defining our problem as a constraint satisfaction problem. If you missed the last video, we defined a special CSP struct, which has values, domains, and constraints, and to solve the problem defined in, in such a way, we need to make sure that we assign all the variables values from their corresponding domains in such a way that all the constraints are satisfied. Here we will start with a very simple instance of this problem. So we will set n equal to 4. We will have 4 by 4 chessboard, which means that we will need to place 4 queens on that chessboard. To encode this as a CSP, we need to first choose our variables. Here our variables will be numbers of rows and the domains will be numbers of columns. So if you get both the number of row and the number of column, you know where the queen is placed. On this chessboard you can see that queen on the top is placed on the first row and the third column. Next queen is placed on the row 2. On the first column, the third queen is placed on the row 3, on the fourth column, and the last queen is placed on the row 4, on the second column. Now we need to encode our constraints to express the problem we are trying to solve. Our definition of what one queen attacking another means, we know that we shouldn't place them on the same row, on the same column, or on the same diagonal. For the rows, we already chose our variables in such a way that we cannot place queens on the same row anyways. Because each variable is a row, we can only assign one column value for that. We can only place one queen. So no constraint is needed here. For expressing that queens should occupy different columns, we need to select pairs of our variables and express that their values, which encode column positions, should be different. We classify diagonals as major, so going from top left to bottom right, and minor going from bottom left to top right. There is a very simple formula to express the constraint major diagonals. So again, taking two rows, uh, the values again to columns, we say that row one minus column one should not be equal to row two minus column two. For the minor diagonals, the constraint is similar. We only replace minuses with pluses. How do we solve that? Last time we talked about AC3 algorithm, which is very useful, but sadly not for this particular problem. It will not be sufficient to solve it, so we need to be a little bit more inventive. Of course, we can try to solve it via brute force search, so trying to scan through all the possible assignments of all the variables. And for very small problem size, like in our case 4x4, it's totally doable. But we will run into problems when we start to increase the board size, our n value. So if we say n is equal to 8, we will have a lot of possible assignments. And of course, if you want to go even larger, it will become problematic very fast. We still will need to search, but we will need to search a bit more intelligently. And for that, we have this algorithm called backtracking. Basic idea of backtracking is very simple. You start with an empty assignment and you assign one variable at a time, checking that the newly added assignment did not break any constraints. The moment you broke some constraints, you need to backtrack. So go one step back and consider a different assignment for the variable. In case all assignments for that particular variable are already exhausted, you need to go back one more step 
and repeat it until you find some assignment where constraints are not broken, where you start to search for assignments for the following variables again. Let's see on a simple example how it works before we'll try to write it in code. Here we have an empty chessboard, an empty assignment. This is our starting initial position for the backtracking search. Next, we decide to place the first queen on the third column. Now we need to assign another variable. Let's try to place the second queen on the second row. And let's say we chose to assign it on the same column. So we assign 2 to 3. We need to check our constraints, and we notice that with this assignment we broke our constraints that prohibits us from assigning the queens on the rows 1 and 2 to the same column. So here we need to backtrack. We go back, removing 2 to 3 assignment, and try another assignment saying 2 to 1. Now no constraint is broken. Let's try to assign the next variable and say we assign the queen in the last column to the last row, so 4 to 4. So far everything good, but we will run in, in problems when we try to assign the queen in the row 3. So first let's try 3 to 1. We break two constraints here. We break the column positioning constraint for the rows 2 and 3, and we break the minor diagonal constraint for the rows 1 and 3. Let's try to select some other value for 3. So here we assign 3 to 2 to the second column. And again we broke a constraint. This time it's major diagonal constraint between rows 2 and 3. Next let's try to assign it to the third column. Now we are breaking the column positioning constraint between rows 1 and 3. And we are breaking the major diagonal constraint between rows 3 and 4. Finally when we try to assign it to the row 4 we ran into another problem of breaking the column constraint between rows 3 and 4. Now we are in a situation where we ran out of options for the variable 3, so we need to backtrack one step further. We remove our previous assignment of 4 to 4, and instead we try something else for that. Let's say we select second column for that queen. Now we are trying to assign the position of the queen in the third row again. First we start with placing it on the first column, that doesn't work. Then we try the second column, doesn't work either. Then we try to place it on the third column, it also doesn't work. But finally, when we place it on the fourth column, it works and our solution is correct. We assigned all the variables and all our constraints are satisfied, so we solved the n queens problem. Now let's see how to express it in Elixir. Between the previous video and this video, I actually published this library for CSP on Hex. So if you want to experiment with it, you can also try it in your projects. There is a high-level interface that allows you to call different methods of solving constraint satisfaction problem in this library via the unified solve method. But here we will talk about this particular part that solves backtracking. You can see examples of how to use the library in the documentation, and you will see a short demo after we talk about this code. Backtracking starts with a high-level function that is accepting CSP struct. We then do a recursive call to ourselves, passing an empty assignment, our original solution, a list of unassigned variables. For now, it's all variables that we have in the CSP, and the CSP definition itself. Then, once we ran through all the recursive steps, we check our returned value, and in case it's nil, we know that we didn't find any solution, so we return no solution atom, otherwise we return the tuple of atom solved and solution. Now the main logic of this function is in this recursive call, so backtrack 3, we have our assignment that we progressively enhance, adding new variables there with each recursive call. We have a list of unassigned variables and we have CSP problem definition. If we ran at the case of having no more unassigned variables, we know that we solved the problem, so we just return the assignment we have. That's the first head of this function. Otherwise, in another head, we select the first unassigned variable, we fetch its domain, and we call in numReduce file. I really love this function. It allows you to maintain some state while walking through the collection and stop execution the moment you found something you were looking for. Here, this function iterates through the domain of the unassigned variable. First, we take the assignment we have and we add a currently selected value for the variable in question. 
to the assignment. Then we call CSP consistent predicate that checks if our constraints are satisfied. In case this is true, we call ourselves recursively with the new assignment and with the list of remaining unassigned variables, excluding the variable we just assigned the value for, and the CSP problem definition. If we get some solution from that recursive call, we stop and return that solution. If solution was not found, we continue its rating through the domain of the original variable that was unassigned. Or, in case we broke any constraints, when we call the CSP consistent predicate, we just also continue iterating through that domain. And that's the whole definition of the backtracking search. Oh, let's see how it works in practice. First, we create a definition of the CSP problem. We select our n to be equal to 8. Here you can see the constraints we have variables, domains, everything is as expected. And then we call our top-level interface here, but in essence what happens is the functions that I showed you. So we just select our method to be backtracking, and we get our solution very quickly. We then have a function pretty print and queens, where we can pass the solution and the end we have, and it shows this nice picture of how the solution looks like, so you can verify that it indeed solved the problem. Now we will try to do the same, but this time setting our n to be 12, and you can see that we get our solution very quickly. There are a number of heuristics for selecting the unassigned variables you try to find an assignment for and the order of the values you try for those assignments in their domains. For the unassigned variables, one commonly used heuristic is select minimum remaining values, which goes through the variables that are not yet assigned and checks how many possible values they have and then selects the variable with the least remaining values. Intuitively, it allows you to terminate early in case if you selected something wrong on one of the previous steps. For the domain values themselves that you try to assign, another heuristic is to order by the least constraining values. So you first try to assign the least constraining values so that you have larger maneuver in the future and you have more chances of actually finding the solution with the assignment you committed to. Finally, backtracking works really well with constraint propagation algorithms too. Of course, it depends on the problem you have. Original definition of AC3 assumes that we try to solve the problem with AC3. Here we will just try to reduce the number of values we consider in each of the unassigned variables, domains. For that, um, I defined another function called AC3 reduce. It's pretty intuitive how to define that, so I will not go into details here but you can check out the source code. I will link it in the video description. In essence, it takes CSP, the current assignment, and the current list of unassigned variables, and it returns new assignment and the new list of unassigned variables. So sometimes AC3 is able to infer values for some of the unassigned variables because there are just no alternative based on the constraint propagation. It can also shorten the amount of um, assignments we need to do in the backtracking procedure. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the problem. For the Anquins problem, it's not a very efficient strategy, but for some more complex problems, it works rather well. The same goes for the minimum remaining values ordered by the least constraining value heuristics. Effectiveness depends on the problem and on the implementation. Since we have implementation in Elixir, we pay a rather large price for using minimum remaining values heuristic, for example. Splitting off the head of the list is way cheaper than going through the list of uh, values, going to hash map, checking how many values they still have in the domain. So in practice, at least for smaller problems with less complex constraints, this heuristic did not work that well for me. Another property of constraint satisfaction problems and any algorithm you will try to use to solve them is that they are very dependent on the way you represent the problem. So here we chose one of the best representations that you can use. Uh, it's very minimal, it's very memory compact, but we can choose some other representations and for more real-world problems it's often very hard to tell which representation will perform best. So for example here one naive representation and the representation I actually started with for each cell on the chessboard 
we assign if the queen is positioned there. So our variables will be tuples expressing coordinates, so row number and column number. Our domains will be true and false for each of those variables. And we will have similar list of constraints. We will need to add constraints for the prohibiting of placement of the queens on the same row. And we will also need to add constraints that ensure that we actually have queens placed on each of the rows. If we look at how performance between our optimal and this very inoptimal or alternative representation works, so here you can see that we are even not one, we are two orders of magnitude slower if we choose the alternative representation. This is easier to see on the logarithmic chart. So often in the real world, if you're working with those problems, you want to try and experiment with different representations and then select the one that performs the best for your particular problem. So here you can see the dependence of the median execution times on n, so on the size of our problem. This plot is with normal axes, so not logarithmic, and you can see that until 12 we are staying on somewhat the same level, but then it explodes and um, the solution time slows down significantly. If we plot it logarithmically, we will get way better perspective of what happens here. And you can see that logarithmic plot makes much more sense. So here, our execution time is in milliseconds. And we can see that for the 4x4 problem, we are under millisecond. The moment we have six queens, we are entering 1.5 milliseconds territory. Once we had eight queens, we are on 13 to 15 milliseconds in my machine. If we go to 12 queens, we are in the hundreds of milliseconds range. So for me, it's usually slightly below 100 milliseconds. And then if you go to 16, we are in the thousands of milliseconds range. So you can see that with the small increments of n, our execution time grows very quickly. And this is not unexpected. This is because n queens and in general constraint satisfaction problems are so-called NP hard problems. And usually you can solve them very quickly for small problem sizes, but once your problem size grows, it becomes very slow to solve them. There are a number of ways to improve that. Um, you can, of course, provide better implementation of the algorithm. You can optimize it so you reduce the time spent on each iteration. You can use the heuristic we discussed. You can also parallelize it and execute it in several threads or in case of elixir in several processes and for example randomize the assignment process so that each process each island process tries to start with different assignment and hopefully one of them will arrive at solution faster but in general backtracking often works really well for smaller problems but not that well for larger problems and that leads us to the topic of the next video, where I want to wrap up the constraint satisfaction discussion. The last one for now in this series about constraint satisfaction problems, I will tell you a bit about the mean conflicts and taboo search, more modern ways of, of solving those problems that do not exhibit this kind of dependence on the problem sets. So, see you next time! <music>